Chapter 15 Why do you work for a living if all you do is work yourself to death? The next morning I decided to step out of my comfort zone. I decided to take a different route to work. I thought it would help spark some creative juices. Sometimes the best way to jumpstart my brain was injecting some randomness into my routine. The altered route only added 15 minutes or so to my drive. To my surprise, I found a new hole-in-the-wall coffee shop. I giddily pulled into the parking lot and grabbed a spot in the back of the coffee shop. I made sure to find a spot over in the rear corner of the parking lot. I always tended to park away from other cars. The way I figured it, it reduced the chance of an accident and I got to get some extra steps in. I found the perfect parking spot. It had an empty spot on each side and was screaming my name. I backed my car into the spot, you know, in case I had to make a quick escape. As I shut off my engine, another car raced into the empty parking spot to my left. It was an early 2000s royal blue Crown Victoria. I wouldn't have paid much attention to it, but the windows were completely blacked out, like the tint on a limousine. As I got out of my car, I started thinking about all the new possibilities for my caffeine fix. Latte or cappuccino? Maybe I'll get a macchiato. A new coffee spot presented all sorts of interesting opportunities for me. As I got closer and closer to the door, someone yelled from behind me, Hold up! Grab the door for me! I turned around and it was the guy who parked next to me. He was wearing these large aviator-style sunglasses and a classic three-button, two-piece black suit. This guy had a five o'clock shadow, slicked back hair, and was probably around 240, 250 pounds. Why would someone so well put together be driving a car like that? I guess some people just cared more about their personal appearance than their ride. I grabbed the door for him and he followed me into the coffee shop. Sometimes the small overtures in life have the biggest payoffs. Thanks, man. I really appreciate it. No problem. After you, I said politely. When I got inside, I was struck by how long the line was. It was about 15 or 20 people deep waiting to order coffee. In that instant, I had to make a judgment call. If I wait this out, there is a high probability I will be late for work. If I left, I wouldn't get my coffee. I figured it was best to see it through and take the risk. What did I really have to lose? I mean, besides my job. As I was standing there in line, I started looking around and took in the atmosphere of the coffee shop. At first glance, it was like any standard coffee shop. Plenty of hipsters and the fresh aroma of finely ground coffee beans. As I began to peruse the menu, I was interrupted by Mr. Royal Blue Crown Victoria. I hope it's worth the wait. I turned around and it was the driver of the Crown Vic. I beamed the obligatory smile his way and awkward head nod. Me too. I don't remember the last time I waited in a line like this. At least not for a cup of coffee. What are you thinking about getting? Coffee. Black coffee. Uh-huh. Hmm. Hmm. What's hmm? He asked with a certain fervor. Black coffee, it's a very safe pick. It says a lot about you as a person. Does it, really? Sure does. How do you figure? Granted, I'd strayed away from the normal stranger small talk, but I had time to kill. Well, you wear a very traditional suit. You carry yourself with your shoulders back, which probably means you take care of yourself. You drive a low-key car. Your tastes are simple, to the point. Nothing flashy, nothing that will make a lot of heads turn. It tells me a lot about you. Uh-huh. It does, does it? For instance. For instance, if I were to guess, I'd say you're former military? I can see my reflection in your shoes. You wear your wristwatch facing inward, not outward. What I don't know is what you do for a living. Wow, you can tell all that from my coffee order. Impressive. I stuck out my hand and introduced myself. Yeah, I was impressed with myself. Who wouldn't be? Deductive reasoning had become one of my strong suits and made for a good conversation starter. 
Mike Allen, nice to meet you. There was nothing but an educated guess. I'm John Daly. Nice to meet you, Mike. We both finally got up to the barista and placed our orders. As we walked over to the waiting area, I asked, So, what do you do for a living, John? Oh, me. I'm in the insurance business. Typically, when people phrased it that way and dressed the way he did, I figured they worked for some large life insurance multi-level marketing scheme. John struck me as more of a compliance kind of guy, rather than a salesman. You do? Me too. Small world. My order was ready, so I picked up my cappuccino from the countertop and dropped a tip in the jar. Great meeting you, John. Have a great day. As I began to make my way back to my car, I was juggling my car keys in my right hand and my cappuccino in my left hand. He yelled out, You too. Oh, by the way, Mike, how do you like working for Flushy? I waved instinctively and stopped for a second in the middle of the coffee shop. Chills ran down my spine. I just met this guy. How does he know where I work? I slowly and cautiously turned back around towards John. I looked him right in his eyes. He lowered his glasses. As I approached him, I asked, How did you know I worked at Flushy? I'm in the insurance business, Mike. I looked with more discontent. Did that mean I was supposed to recognize this guy? Was this one of the suits following me from Flushy? Why don't we grab a seat and chat for a bit? It'll only take a minute of your time. I was hesitant, but reluctantly agreed. He motioned me over to an empty table, and we sat down. He took a giant gulp of his coffee, and we sat there silently for a couple minutes. Did you know the traditional way of thinking is that the first person who speaks during a negotiation loses? Is that what we're doing? We're negotiating? No, not at all, Mike. We're just talking. Look, John, I don't have all day, so what's your angle? John smiled and looked back at me. Mike, have you met Todd? Todd? That's what this is about? Todd Dupree. The question still stands. Have you met him yet? No, I haven't. He's on vacation. Hmm, I hear that the Caribbean is pretty nice this time of year. Europe? He's in Europe with his family. What's your point? Is he? Oh, my mistake. John smiled again, but this time it was more of a smirk. You've been working for Flushy for a few months now, more or less. And... What of it? It's quite incredible to see someone rise through ranks, really in such a meteoric fashion. I mean, a couple of weeks ago you were a sales puke, and now you're part of the senior leadership team. Especially for someone who hasn't even met one of the co-founders of the very business he works for. This wasn't quite the conversation I was expecting. Serves me right for changing my routine. This is what I get for trying new things. I really couldn't read this guy, and for some reason that bothered the heck out of me. Mike, how do you think something like that happens? The whole thing seems rather fascinating to me looking from the outside in. It's just hard work, that's all. John smiled from ear to ear and shook his head. Yeah, hard work, that's it. And you believe that? Look, I don't have time to sit here and listen to some kind of lame attempt at a motivational speech or a lame sales pitch. Can we get to the point already? Your concern, albeit intoxicating, if aimed at me, is completely misplaced. What you should be concerned about is working at Flushy. What? What kind of nonsense is that? How so? What are you trying, to recruit me or something? Man, if this is some half-baked job interview, I can stop you right here and now. People in the coffee shop were starting to stare at me, so I toned down the rhetoric. These days, one bad camera phone video can ruin your career in a matter of seconds. I sell insurance, Mike. That's it. I stood up and kicked out my chair. I wasn't going to waste my time any more listening to this guy. As I began to walk away, John asked, 
How many people have to die before you open your eyes? How many before you're next? I looked back at John, paused for a moment, picked my chair back up, and sat back down. Oh, I have your attention now. You sales executives are all the same. What I mean is, Flushy has a great way of thinning the herd. What do you mean by that? Don't tell me you haven't noticed anything weird going on. Don't sit there and tell me it hasn't concerned you seeing all these young, healthy people dying in mysterious circumstances. Does the insurance you sell come with a free tinfoil hat? Jokes. Yeah, you got jokes. I'm happy you can joke around. John slammed a file folder on the table and began to take another big gulp of his coffee. See this? he asked and pointed to the folder. Yeah, it's a manila file folder. So what? What is it? What is it? Use your imagination, Mike. Use your deductive reasoning skills. John slid the file over to me. I slowly opened the file folder. At first, it didn't seem like much. It was a list of flushy employees who died just after two years, and they all died under mysterious circumstances. Upon further inspection, I realized it was full of what appeared to be crime scene photos, coroner reports, and various witness statements. What? What is this? Why are you showing me this? I knew exactly what it was. Maybe part of me just couldn't handle what it was. Part of me didn't want to know what it was. I felt an upswell in my stomach. You know what it is, don't you? It's your future, Mike. Another name in my file. Another chalk outline of a body on the pavement. Another accidental car crash waiting to happen. Another insurance claim waiting to happen. Who are you? Special Agent John Daly. I'm an insurance fraud investigator with the Federal Bureau of Investigation. We have reason to believe that Flushy is involved in some kind of intra-insurance company money laundering fraud scheme. We believe they are systematically killing off their employees for financial gain, among many other financial crimes. I burst out laughing and even had some of my cappuccino come out of my nose. I started looking around. This had to be some kind of candid camera show. The FBI? You had me going there for a second. Insurance fraud investigator. I gotta remember that one. That's rich. Flushy masterminding some giant cabal of death. Well, it was good talking with you, bud. That was entertaining. You really made my day. John's reaction wasn't exactly what I was expecting. His demeanor hadn't changed at all. Nothing, not even a wink and a smile. He was looking at me with a serious disposition. After the laughter subsided, John said, Are you finished? Look, John, this ain't funny, man. I haven't worked at Flushy very long, but don't you think it would be pretty obvious that the company is playing an active role in murdering its own employees? Come on, man! I know how it all must sound. It's all 100% true. You can choose to help us or not. Either way, this house of cards is going to come tumbling down. Kid, you really just got to ask yourself one question. I took a sip of my cappuccino. I figured I'd play along a little while longer. What could it hurt? I asked with a pompous tone, And what is that? What is that one question I should be asking myself? When that house of cards comes falling down, where do you want to be? On the inside or the outside? It was hard for me to believe this guy was an FBI agent. Granted, he had absolutely no fashion sense and a flair for dramatic language. He took a long sip of his coffee and slammed it down on the table. Well, I'm done with my coffee. I'll let you back at it. John got up from the table and handed me a business card. Remember, I sell insurance. Insurance, Mike. When you want to talk, hopefully it won't be too late to get that insurance. Don't let them drag you into deep waters. There will be a point where not even I can save you from drowning. All I could do is scoff. I was struggling to find the words. 
At this point, I couldn't even make eye contact with John. Who knew if John was really his name? Oh, one more thing. Mike, are you familiar with the concept of a tontine? To say that I was dumbfounded would have been an understatement. I had a pretty robust understanding of the modern insurance vernacular, but was completely unaware of a tontine. John scoffed at my unmistakable display of ignorance. All I could do was shrug my shoulders and look away. That's a real shame. John shook his head, did a 180, and walked away. Well, that will teach me to try new things. Never again. I tucked his business card into my back pocket. I took a deep breath and a sigh of relief. I sat back in my chair and took some time to think. Did I miss something? Is this guy for real? What was my next move? I finished up my cappuccino, but it's not like I could even enjoy it. Is there really anything worse in this world than a wasted cappuccino? What time is it? I looked down at my smartwatch and it read 8 a.m. I decided to head back to the office. Better late than never. It's not like being 15 minutes late was going to kill me. As I approached the building, I decided to park in the normal employee parking lot with the common folk. After hunting for a parking spot for about 10 minutes, I managed to find the perfect one. I parked my car and headed for the lobby. The lobby was in a state of complete disarray. There were people and construction materials scattered all about. I shook it off and creeped towards the private elevator. I took out my key card and right before I could swipe it, the elevator opened up for me. As the elevator doors opened further, I noticed they had installed some new security features. The most notable was the facial recognition system and the wireless microphones hanging from the top of the elevator. I put my face close to the scanner and it made a loud bing sound. A voice came over the loudspeaker. Welcome, Mike Allen. The doors to the elevator closed and it rapidly ascended to my floor. As the doors reopened, I thought this was kind of peculiar timing to be installing new security features. It was safe to say my day was ruined before it began. Either way, I better play this whole FBI thing pretty close to the vest. To my surprise, there were a couple of new faces on the office floor. It looks like someone finally decided to fill up those cubicles. I started walking around the office, more of a brisk stroll than a walk. I navigated my way past all of the cubicles and made it to my private office. Gilroy was typing away on the computer, at what I had no idea. Hey! She looked up and said, Hey to you as well. What's up, boss man? What's with all the new people? Didn't you read the memo? They gave you ten direct reports. Who is they? I don't know. I only work here. That's above my pay grade. Okay, but what do I do with them? I mean, they're your employees. At this point, I had a pretty flimsy understanding of my overall job. How in the world was I supposed to manage and lead ten people, especially if I couldn't lead myself? Gilroy, do me a favor and gather the troops for me. Round them up. Gilroy stopped typing, calmly stood up, let out a big whistle, and then in her best attempt at a baritone said, Gather around, y'all! Team meeting! People slowly got up from their cubicles and started gathering around me. In front of me stood my team. Ten fresh-out-of-college mouth-breathers. The group stood in front of me waiting for me to say something. If there's one thing I knew about being a manager, it was that you want to give rousing and inspirational speeches. Being a manager was all about form, not content. The best managers tended to know the least about a subject, but knew the most about how to talk to people. Listen up, you people. You work for me now. We have one key priority in this department. We are here to grow a completely new distribution channel for the company. People started nodding in agreement. I could tell they were captivated right off the bat. One of the members closest to me took a slight step back. I didn't realize it, but my lunch must have left quite an offensive odor seeping out of my mouth. My atrocious breath aside, I still needed to give a rousing speech. 
Take a second and wrap your heads around that. It won't be easy. I won't have all the answers, but we will do our best. We have to lead through the fog. In times of great uncertainty, winners are either made or destroyed. Gilroy leaned in and whispered to me, Good stuff! Our strategy is simple. Three words, I said, holding up three fingers. I could tell I had them hanging on my every word. Three simple words. S-M-F. Sell more fleshy. I want you to remember those words. Nay, I need you to remember those words. Whenever you have to make a decision, ask yourself, does this help me sell more fleshy or does it get in my way of selling more fleshy? I took a sip of my cappuccino and waited for a second to let that maturate. The group was nodding in unison, so I decided to continue. We're going to start aggressively acquiring insurance brokerages. We're going to convince them to sell out. In exchange for their clients, we'll offer them gainful employment with lucrative equity positions here at Flushy. I could really get used to this whole senior vice president thing. I could tell that I had a real knack for it. Say a bunch of fancy words, throw out some half-cocked ideas, and yell at people to keep them in line. Think of it like a reverse merger. It's all about synergy. Our department is tasked with a two-pronged stratagem. We're going to divide and conquer. The plan is to buy insurance brokerages and switch clients over to Flushy. We'll make sizable offers, offers that agents would be foolish to pass up. We'll then steal market share from our competitors. And then, after stealing enough market share from other carriers, we can offer to buy the carriers for pennies on the dollar. In fact, some of these carriers will hemorrhage so much premium that they will be begging to sell out. That's the plan. I gauged the room to make sure everyone was following me. In reality, I just made all of that up off the top of my head. This company didn't have much of a coherent strategy. It was deemed confidential, so nobody ever actually bothered talking about the strategy. Any questions? No? Okay. Let's get to work and find some insurance agencies to buy. Sell more fleshy. Someone in the background raised their hand. I pointed at him and yelled, Yeah, you. What is it? Mr. Allen, how do we plan on doing that? The first deliverable is to make a list of insurance agencies. The second deliverable is to right-size that list. The final deliverable is to send out an email blast out to that list with the plan. Someone else raised their hand. Guys, don't raise your hand. This isn't preschool. Just speak up. What do we say in the email? What do you mean? What's the content strategy for the email blast? You are the content strategy. Why do you think I have you all around? Go figure it out. I thought that was a good place to end the conversation. So I clapped my hands together and headed back to my office. In my head, it all sounded like a good plan. The group disbanded from the crescent moon-shaped circle and everyone went about their days.